It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone back to the Storage X International Symposium. My name is Will Chu. I'm a professor of material science engineering here at Stanford University and the core director of the Storage X Initiative. First, I just want to thank all of you uh, for attending our symposium. Although maybe it's a little hard to see, um, we have enjoyed uh, your attendance ranging from 1,500 to over 3,000 viewers at one time. In this difficult time of the pandemic, we are really excited to have sponsored a forum where everybody can get together, discuss science, and think about the next steps. And to continue on that excellent set of talks we have heard over the past five weeks, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Speaking first will be Professor Yetming Chang from MIT's Department of Material Science Engineering. Yet is a true pioneer in the energy storage field. He has been working on energy storage since the 1990s, first approaching it from the perspective of electroceramics and then continue on that to innovative chemistry, whether it's synthesis, characterization, properties, and also understanding the many technical economic and business cases for it. Yet is also an extremely unique innovator in energy storage. Not only is he an innovator in science, fundamental science and understanding all the underlying material properties necessary for energy storage to function well. But also, he is an innovator in commercializing and carrying out the very challenging task of tech transfer, taking laboratory curiosities to reality. And yet has started numerous companies, uh, not all of them in the energy storage area. I thought I'd just mention them. Uh, he started American Superconductor, a123, 24M, Form Energy, and Desktop Metal. Um, yet, I apologize if I missed a few. And it's extremely fun to see all the things that have been translated from his laboratory um, to the real world. And I'm excited to hear from you today on understanding all the challenges, not only scientifically, but also what it takes to take the technology and, and make it real. Yet is very accomplished uh, scientist engineer. Uh, he has received many awards. Uh, he's a member of the National Academies of Engineering. And importantly, he has also trained many people, um, some of whom are starting companies of their own and making contribution to the energy storage community in every possible way. Our second speaker, Professor Yi Tui, my colleague and co-director of the initiative, will be speaking second today. And Yi is similar to Yet in that he's also an innovator, both scientifically and also on technology transfer. He is one of the most prolific scientists in material science and has started three companies, Amprius, for Sear, E Innovate, and he too, like yet, is fully committed to seeing scientific innovations come from the laboratory to the real world. And I'm sure he will also allude to some of the many challenges and what it takes to get the technology to the real world. Yet, um, let's start with you first. I'm really delighted to hear from you today. I hope you'll share many of your exciting and perhaps crazy ideas on what the next steps is for energy storage. Yet the floor is yours. Thank you, Will, and uh, thank you, Yi, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever uh, you are listening in from. Uh, I thought I would uh, talk about uh, some things a little bit different from the previous speakers uh, who have spoken in this, uh, this symposium and. Uh, whose uh, talks I've uh, uh, listened to. 
And uh, so my title is you know, energy storage from the macro to micro perspective. And so first I wanted to, on this slide, acknowledge the, uh, the various uh, uh, programs and uh, uh, sponsors who've funded the research that I'll uh, speak about. Uh, what I mean by uh, the macro perspective here is that I'd like to begin in the next slide here, um, talking about my personal take on you know, why we do the research that we do. And specifically, you know, in this energy storage area, and you know, if I uh, look at the uh, pie chart here of global GHG uh, emissions, you know, uh, the work that we do in storage touches on many of those, and I'll just uh, refer to ones that I personally uh, am involved with. And so, transportation, of course, uh, we're all uh, all of you are aware that it relies on higher energy density, longer life, lower cost, safer batteries. And so, um, you know, Micro has a number of projects underway in this area related to uh, solid electrolytes, for example. But you already heard about that from uh, Jurgen Yannick and uh, uh, Lyndon Nazar. So I won't talk about that today. Uh, and uh, we are we have some uh, work on electrolytes and uh, in particular interfacial uh, transport in electrolytes that, that just uh, was published last week in Nature Energy. But you know you've already heard about that, so I'm not going to spend any time talking about that. Right? And uh, we have some projects on uh, lithium metal uh, interfacing interfacing with solid electrolytes, and I also won't talk about that. Uh, and that's supported by uh, both DOE and now Aurora Flight Sciences because of the direction of you know, electric aviation. Right? Uh, and then we have you know, uh, grid scale electricity. And I will talk a little bit about that. And I'll spend some time uh, trying to uh, explain uh, where the needs are and what, what we should keep in mind when we think about uh, that particular problem. Right? Uh, and then, uh, I have one other project that is really uh, far out there, which is uh, uh, sponsored by Google, which is actually a, a, a fresh look at the problem uh, or the potential uh, of cold fusion. Right? And so that's, uh, that really is uh, the, the most uh, speculative and far out uh, problem that I work on. But the work that we do there is really focused on uh, trying to create unusual new materials in the form of metal hydrides. Right? And then uh, I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about electrochemistry applied to industrial processes and a, uh, what I think is a, uh, a slightly different way of looking at how we as battery scientists and electrochemists can contribute to that problem. Now, there's a big part of this uh, pie chart where uh, I haven't yet done anything professionally, which is the lower right-hand quadrant, you know, agriculture, right? Uh, but I do practice uh, personally uh, some agriculture. And so here's a view of our uh, chickens, both the, the meat chickens and the egg chickens in our backyard. But I, I want to tell you that I'm completely convinced that electrochemistry uh, can bring much to agriculture. And we're trying to you know, identify the, the right kinds of uh, problems uh, to solve there. Right? So uh, this is the scope of the things I work on. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today uh, first is the problem of uh, storage as it applies to enabling a renewable grid, 100% renewable electric grid. Right? And uh, it's a macro perspective because I'm going to start uh, from uh, really the top down view and uh, look what, uh, what is necessary to make this happen. And the first thing uh, to point out is that you know, the way we generate electricity is actually rapidly evolving today. And in this scenario, there are winners and losers. In the left-hand uh, chart here, what you see is that you know, coal is declining, as we all know, and uh, it, it will continue to decline, but purely for economic reasons. Uh, you know, we might give it a push, uh, but it's on its way out and it will continue to go in that direction. And the main reason for that is the uh, rise of natural gas. Okay. Nuclear is relatively flat. Uh, conventional hydro generation is relatively flat. Okay. The only two that are increasing are renewables and natural gas. But you see that natural gas is about a factor of four higher than renewables. 
Uh, the reason for all this is apparent, I think, to uh, almost everyone. It's in the lower right-hand chart here. It's the fact that, you know, in much of the world today, the lowest cost of electricity we have available to us is uh, renewables. Right? And so uh, one looks at this and you might come to the conclusion that you know, natural gas is the natural winner here. Right? And uh, what could change that, though, is if we come up with a breakthrough in storage. And so what I'd like to now talk about is, you know, what would that breakthrough have to look like right, in order uh, for, for we to beat natural gas? Right? So that's a simple objective. Let's beat natural gas. Right? Okay. And you get the impression from uh, looking at the rise of grid storage based on lithium ion batteries that, you know, uh, maybe lithium ion batteries uh, are going to do uh, all of the uh, work for us. Uh, but I'll, I'll try to show that that is unlikely to be the case. Right? And so over the last few years, the installations have been dominated by lithium ion. But at some point, I really uh, think that that is going to start to change. Okay, so you know, lithium ion initially uh, was put on the grid uh, for, you know, for short-term, uh, short-duration high power uh, applications. The photograph here is Laurel Mountain, West Virginia. And at the time, uh, that was the largest uh, uh, lithium ion farm in the world. Now it's eclipsed by uh, quite a few others, several hundred megawatt hours. Right? And th the applications uh, in that case were to uh, help with wind ramping into the grid. Uh, that uh, you know when the the wind energy came too fast, uh, the grid couldn't handle it in that location. And you have similar applications with the duct curve that uh, 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 most of you are familiar with on the left, where the early you know evening uh, demand is what creates a, a short-term uh, storage issue. Okay. And also recognize that in this whole scenario, the amount of storage we actually practice today is very small relative to total power capacity generation. So of the electricity we generate, very, very little is stored. It's the little blue bubble in there. And then that tiny little circle is what we actually do with batteries. So, uh, uh, so Grid storage today is a very small part of the electricity ecosystem. Okay, okay. Uh, how much storage would we actually need to fully decarbonize the electricity system uh, by, I'll choose the date of 2050, okay? And uh, this is a problem that uh, at the MIT Energy Initiative we have been looking into. We're conducting a study called the Future Storage Study. I'm sharing that study with uh, Bob Armstrong, who's the director of the MIT Energy Initiative. And so it, it's, it's still, you know, uh, about a year from uh, coming out in print. But uh, I can tell you a couple of things that we're doing. Right? One of these is to try to estimate how much grid storage might be needed in order to fully decarbonize uh, the electricity system. And so the estimates here come from a, a group, uh, uh, Patrick Brown and others. Uh, and there are a number of caveats here, but you see what the headline is. The headline is 100 terawatt hours of grid storage by 2050, right? And where does the uncertainty in this estimate come from? Well, a lot of it comes from the fact that, well, we don't know how much new transmission will be built. We also don't know what the future cost of storage will be built, but that's the one that, you know, with uh, battery research has some uh, influence on. Uh, and we also uh, don't know how much the renewables will be overbuilt because the two kind of go hand in hand. Right? Uh, renewable overbuilding and storage are the trade-offs on the, on the same problem. Uh, transmission is uh, actually lower cost than storage today, uh, but you know, the U.S. is not, quote, a copper plate. Right? And so uh, there are significant barriers to transmission uh, build out. And so one has to make some assumptions here. Right? But essentially, uh, what the early assumptions or early, sorry, early uh, uh, predictions here or estimations here say is that we might need on the order of 10 terawatt hours for the US, multiply that by 10 for the world, it's 100 terawatt hours. Uh, and that's not counting uh, the electric fleet. So to put 100 terawatt hours in perspective, uh, that's equal to about a billion Tesla Model S cars. Right? If by 2050, uh, you know, it can, you know, we have um, uh, 9 billion or so US uh, 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 humans uh, living on the planet, 
you know, we're really talking about one Tesla Model S size pack for every 10 people or so to kind of give you a, a scale of what that might mean. And so the, the question we might ask is, you know, so what do we need in order to meet that 100 terawatt hours? Well, uh, the, the question of, uh, you know, what lithium ion can do comes up over and over again. And I want to show you a couple of just two slides from some work that is ongoing, uh, led by Elsa, uh, Elsa Olivetti and Bob Jaffe, uh, colleagues of mine here at MIT who are working uh, uh, on this feature of storage study. Right. And the resource limitations uh, uh, are always in uh, our minds, and so lithium is one of them for sure. Right. And what this plot shows you is on the horizontal axis is uh, on the log scale, how much storage we might need. And so you see our 100 terawatt hours uh, uh, there. And compared to that, you know, the resource limit is actually higher. Right? So there is actually enough lithium available. Uh, but the bigger problem is that depending on where this lithium goes, so here we have 100%, 50%, 25%. And what that means is that the additional mining of lithium 100% of it goes towards, uh, in this case, uh, lithium ion batteries versus 50 or 25% of it. And then over on the left-hand side, we have an axis which is compound annual growth rate of production, which means of mining, right? And so uh, we would need to, if by uh, 2050, we reach 100 terawatt hours, and we use all of that lithium for lithium ion batteries, we need to increase production at a rate of 10% per year now through 2050. And if you look at the historical uh, scaling of production, which is this, these yellow bars over here, what you find is that it's at the upper limit, right? And so the basic message here is that it's a very heavy lift to get there. Right? Not theoretically impossible, but a very heavy lift. Right? If we look at cobalt and nickel and what would be required there, and so, of course, it depends on how much cobalt and how much nickel, and that's why you have 811 and 622 uh, shown here. You know, we've left off um, uh, 111. Uh, what you see is that the story is somewhat similar. Uh, the total resource you know, would actually exceed the 100 terawatt hours you need, but the compound growth rate in production is large in all cases. And so it actually uh, starts to tell us that you know, uh, maybe it's not the amount, but you know, how do you scale mining at 10% worldwide a year uh, now through the year 2050? Okay. So uh, as I said, very heavy lift. Okay, okay so um, let me uh, then talk about uh, how, you know, what kind of batteries might we need uh, that might serve that function, which are not lithium ion. And I'm gonna, Describe a study that uh, has, uh, that was uh, published, uh, I think, uh, in 29, uh, late last year. Uh, and uh, this is a case where, uh, in collaboration with Jessica Transic, uh, who does uh, systems analysis here at MIT, uh, we looked at the way that electricity is generated today and uh, tried to uh, uh, predict uh, how it could be done with renewable generation and storage. And so the beginning part of this is just to tell you a little bit about how electricity is generated today. And there are basically three types of power plants in the US. We have you know, base load generation, which for example, includes uh, nuclear, but also others. And this is just 24 seven flat uh, power. And then we have intermediate generation, which is about an eight hour block. And then we have what we call peakers, which about, is about a four hour block. And so I'll tell you about a study in which we greatly simplified the production, the output profiles of these into either just flat line or simple square waves. Okay? And the reality of these situations is that the output profile, so if one were doing this in a, you know, in, in targeting specific applications and specific regions, you would have an output profile which is much lumpier and, and more nuanced than what I'm showing you here in these simple square waves. But you know, we're beginning with, uh, with these uh, uh, simple square waves that have a, a rated power and a a finite duration. Right? Okay, we pick four locations in the U.S. and these are uh, intended to uh, choose a diversity of resources. And that big purple belt in the middle is the you know is the wind belt. That's where the the dust bowl was. And so uh, and the north the upper Midwest and then West Texas. Okay? 
Arizona, uh, clearly a solar rich state. Massachusetts, you know, uh, poor solar, poor wind, right? Uh, so uh, using those locations, I wanna just show you in this chart, this is Iowa, uh, where the wind is somewhat better than the solar, right? And what this shows you is at the end of the analysis, which what the analysis does is to calculate the combination of renewable generation and storage uh, that gives you the lowest cost of delivered electricity, uh, the uh, lowest LCOE. Okay? And you know, we make reasonable assumptions here for how much wind and solar will cost. You see them in the lower left here, you know, 1,500 a kilowatt for wind, 1,000 kilowatt for solar. Okay? And this is a calculation for essentially 100% availability. So you can always, you, you never miss, you always deliver the electricity that, need, that, that you need. The study you know, it takes into consideration other cases such as what if you only put, you need to be 95% reliability? 5% of the time, people don't get what they want in terms of their electricity, right? And so results will vary, so there are nuances there, right? But the main thing here I want, to, I want to point out is that the scale, vertical scale, is the state of charge of the battery, 100. And so this uh, goes all the way down to a fully depleted battery. And of course, that's the sizing of the battery. You know, for the worst case scenario where you actually fully discharge the battery. And over the horizontal axis is years, uh, 20 years, and this is based on backwards looking availability, uh, resource availability data right, for, those, for, the, for, these, for this location. And the main point here you see is that, you know, you have relatively infrequent, uh, but uh, multi-day uh, deep cycles, you know, deep discharges. And the purpose of the battery, it stays mostly charged, uh, and you can you know, certainly use that state of charge for other functions, but uh, you, know, you need to cover these long durations of several days. Right? Okay, so um, what does that mean in terms of the cost of the battery that you would need to do it, <laughs> to do this as the service function? And uh, so this is one way of representing the data. And it's a cost of power on the vertical axis in dollars per kilowatt and cost of energy on the horizontal axis, dollars per kilowatt hour. And the main thing, the color coding is to help uh, with, the, you know, uh, with the eye. And uh, what we're trying to beat here is CCGT in the blue. And so what this shows you is that in order to get down into the blue, uh, first of all, the cost of storage on an energy basis has to be less than about $30 a kilowatt hour. Uh, the sensitivity to the cost of power is not so great. These are relatively vertical lines rather than horizontal lines. So you can tolerate some variation in cost of power, but cost of energy is super important. Right? And then if you have kilowatts and kilowatt hours, of course the slope is related to hours uh, or duration. And what you see is here, you know, here's a, a, a case of 40 hours. And here's case 100 hours. And so you see the multi-day aspect coming out. That's a four-day storage cycle, right? And the other thing I'll point out is that, you know, lithium ion, I think is, for, for the grid, is uh, way off to the right. It's about $250 a kilowatt hour today. Right? So it's not even on this chart, right? um, Okay. So uh, what we see is that, you know, we need something less than 30 kilowatt hours and, uh, 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 out of four, four day duration here. Right? If you look at, if you take that kind of a plot and now just apply it to the in, in, entire study that we did here, we have wind and we have solar, and there's also the combination of two. You can change the ratio two to optimize. And we have here in these, you know, these quadrant charts, wind for the four applications, you know, base load, intermediate load, peaker, and there's something called a bi-peaker, which is just two cycles in the day, okay? And uh, then we have over here the storage capacity. Uh, well, this is the, the four states that I talked about. And basically what you see here is that Texas is, you know, uh, is good in wind and good in solar. Arizona is uh, really only good in solar. What this leads us to is that uh, when, we, when we did this study, we said, uh, let's look specifically at a couple of different battery options. Let's consider one that's lithium ion like. Right? And li what lithium ion like means in this case is that uh, it's a future looking perspective, $150 a kilowatt, kilowatt hour you know, installed. Uh, and the cost of power is relatively low, $700 a kilowatt. And then 
a future low cost chemistry. And I'll give you an example of that in just a bit, which is $20 a kilowatt hour. So super low cost uh, on an energy basis. And in this case, because it's going to be a, a, you know, imagine a flow type battery, the cost of power tends to be a little bit higher. And what the vertical axis here is, is the uh, dollars per kilowatt hour of delivered electricity. And each one of these small lower bars is the low energy cost option, technology two. The higher bar is the future lithium ion. And the color coding here is across the four different regions. And it tells you whether you choose to use mostly wind, which is the blue, or, or mostly solar, which is the red, right? And so what you see is that the lower cost on an energy basis battery always wins, right? Again, an uh, argument for technologies other than lithium ion, right? If you can get there. So this is a complicated, uh, a complex view of how to beat natural gas, uh, but I want to give you a, a really simple way to uh, do it. And you might say, why don't you just do this at the beginning? Um, okay, uh, natural gas today, a natural gas power plant, it, it depends on what type, but it costs you about $1,000 a kilowatt of delivered, uh, uh, this is the capital cost, $1,000 a kilowatt to deliver electricity. And so if we had to run that with a battery over a 100 hour period, would require about $10 a kilowatt hour. And then grid electricity today is about $250 a kilowatt hour for delivery a couple of years from now. And that explains why it's suitable for the four hour duration, okay? But, uh, so now the question of what can do the ten, uh, $10 a kilowatt hour. All right. Um, quickly, very few uh, battery chemistries actually clear this cost bar, right? Um, and the ones that are uh, of interest have to be well below $10 a kilowatt hour just for the chemicals, which is what's plotted here, right? And what this shows you is that, well, sodium sulfur uh, could be attractive. Right? It has a problem if it's high temperature because that adds a lot of cost. You, know, you see iron iron on here, you see zinc iron. Uh, so there are a few options that might make it. Okay? And uh, we found one option here, which is essentially a room temperature version of sodium sulfur. And so I'll show you that one uh, quickly. Okay? Uh, this we published uh, a couple of years ago. It's a battery that uses a polysulfide on the left. So if you look down on the anode side here of this, it's a uh, polysulfide, lithium or sodium, but sodium is preferred, where we cycle over a stable polysulfide speciation range. And don't precipitate it, and don't uh, take it too far to where it's uh, unstable. And then on the cathode side, uh, we actually have a oxygen reaction, right? And what the sodium does is to change the, uh, as it, it, as it uh, crosses over, changes uh, the pH and causes the oxygen uh, breathing reaction. And so sulfur doesn't directly react with oxygen, but it's really a, a sulfur air battery. And this is one that has ultra low cost. And so this is the cost of battery, and this is the duration over which it operates. And it has a curve because there's a power stack here that at short duration raises the cost, uh, but the floor is the energy cost due to the low cost chemicals. Okay? So this would be one of these. Okay. okay. Uh, one important point I want to make on these new battery chemistries is that there are going to be some important trade-offs. A friend of mine likes to say, you know, uh, batteries are just like people. Every one of them is you know, deeply flawed in some way. It's just, what are the flaws that you can live with? And if you look at our data for this battery uh, that we uh, published, if you look at the discharge and charge curves, the round trip efficiency is only about 50%. And in fact, you know, that, was a, that was a big problem for our reviewers on this paper. Is that, is that really a battery? What kind of battery is this? Only 50% round trip efficiency, right? But on the right-hand side, I will show, uh, what I show you here is a plot which shows the levelized cost of electricity for a low cost flow battery versus the round trip efficiency for that battery. And on this plot, it looks pretty steep, but really, it amounts to only one cent a kilowatt hour difference in the levelized cost of electricity that you deliver if you go from, for instance, 80% round trip efficiency all the way down to 55. Right? So the message is that round trip efficiency is something that we can give up quite a bit of 
if we have very low cost chemistries here. Okay, uh, the kind of batteries we envision look something like this. Uh, this is a battery that has a power footprint like that of natural gas, which we think is possible based on calculation, the calculations. One to two megawatts per acre, right? Which is uh, what a natural gas peaker uh, does. And it would occupy a footprint like this re relative to a, um, the uh, wind farm, right? And so uh, we started a company, and uh, this is a photo of uh, five founders, and uh, it's called Form Energy, located in Somerville, Massachusetts. The CEO of the company is the fellow on the far left here, Matteo Jaramillo, uh, who was formerly uh, an executive at Tesla, and in fact started the division called Tesla Energy. Right? Uh, and so uh, I want to just give you one recent headline, long duration breakthrough. Form Energy's first project tries pushing storage to 150 hours. This is a 150 megawatt hour uh, battery. And so uh, the 150 hours here, you know, if you're a battery uh, researcher, you might say, hey, 150 hours? Well, I can do 150 hours. My cell phone can do 150 hours. They just discharge it slowly. But what I hope I've showed you is that the point is not that you can discharge the battery over 150 hours, but, but that it's cost effective uh, for that kind of an application. Uh, because of the uh, need to uh, uh, reach that low cost of delivered electricity. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the first topic I wanted to talk about. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk about another kind of, uh, kind of top-down uh, view on uh, energy storage. And electrolysis, which we all know and uh, know quite a bit about, as a means of chemical energy storage, and the image I have shown you here is a neutral water electrolyzer. So this is pH 7 water. Dissolved in it is uh, sodium nitrate. So what you're seeing here is a pH scale. And what it's showing you is that on the right-hand side, I'm producing a base. On the left-hand side, I'm producing an acid. And of course, at the same time, I'm producing hydrogen and oxygen gas. Right? But rather than thinking of electrolysis as a way to create hydrogen, which we store for, as energy storage. Let's think about storing an acid in a base. And not so much for electricity production, but for energy storage for other purposes. Right? What is that other purpose? The one that we've been looking at is cement. Right? Cement today has uh, the following problems. It uh, is uh, uh, a giant CO2 emitter, the largest industrial uh, 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 production process, the largest emitter uh, ahead of steel. Right? And that CO2 emission, half of it comes from chemical CO2 due to the limestone, and the other half comes from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the thermal energy in the process. Right? So, uh, you know, what is limestone? Limestone is uh, calcium carbonate. Here's limestone used in an architectural setting at MIT. It's just calcium carbonate and some impurities. And uh, the cement that we talk about is the paste, is the glue that holds together the gravel that we then call concrete, right? Okay, and so uh, it's a, you know, four gigatons of CO2 per year uh, produced uh, you know, from cement, one kilogram CO2 per kilogram cement. And so what does the future look like here? Uh, if we look at the urbanization of the planet, and it's predicted that in 2060, there'll be double the number of buildings on earth that we have uh, today. And what that means is that for the next 40 years, we will build out the equivalent, the equivalent in cement and concrete of one New York City every 30 days. Okay. So that's what it looks like. Where does the electrolysis come in? Well, uh, if we do what I showed you and produce an acid in the base uh, in the uh, electro electrolytic process, what we can then do is to take our lime and dissolve it in the acid, right, which is on the left here, evolving CO2 along with the oxygen we produced at that electrode. And what this gives you is clean, pure CO2, which then can be sequestered or used for actually you know, more valuable functions than uh, just being sequestered. The chemical process that you can carry out if you simultaneously have the base present is to take that calcium that's now dissolved and at pH 
10 or 12 or so, we precipitate out calcium hydroxide. Okay? And so this calcium hydroxide can now be captured. I'm going to flash forward here. And I'll just show you what the calcium hydroxide looks like here. Uh, this is uh, an electrochemical reactor for making calcium hydroxide. Uh, this is cement, uh, the, the, the active phase of cement called alite made with that calcium hydroxide. Yeah. Um, and this is what it does. On the left is natural limestone. When we send it through a reactor of this kind, uh, first of all, it's selective. It, pure, it's, it purifies, gives us pure hydrated lime or calcium hydroxide in this case, and the precipitates are insoluble. Okay? And so what this leads us to is a scenario where now you know, renewable electricity could be used in an electrolytic setting, uh, producing hydrogen if it's, an, if it's a water electrolyzer, but not only for energy storage, but for chemical storage which we can then use in a, number of, uh, in a number of reactions. Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful talk connecting the macro to the micro. So we have time uh, for some questions now. And um, maybe let me first um, begin by asking a, a high level question. So in the systems analysis portion of your talk yet, you made very explicit comparison between electrochemical energy storage technologies and mechanical. Uh, so I see Palm Hydro feature very prominently on your plot. Can you also speak to a little bit about the comparison to thermal energy storage? Yeah, um, yeah yes, happy to. So uh, thermal storage, I think the first thing to be said about thermal storage is that Thermal storage is a very, very low cost technology. If what you need is heat, if you store it as heat and you use it as heat, right? And there are actually a number of uh, reasons to do that. You know, uh, those in the nuclear industry, for example, uh, are now looking much, uh, have renewed interest in the heat output of nuclear reactors and how they can be used in industrial settings. And so that's, you know, that's, that's a perfect, uh, perfect application. I think that thermal storage, where you then have to convert back to electricity, if it's the electricity that you want, uh, it's that conversion cost that goes, uh, goes up quite a bit. Okay. And uh, there are uh, thermal, so <clears throat> there are some uh, technologies that are being uh, looked at uh, today um, and uh, for, for storing it as heat and then re-reacting back to, uh, and, and then converting back to electricity. And uh, I think, you know, my view on that is that uh, that is uh, potentially competitive uh, with electrochemical storage. Uh, the energy density of electrochemical storage is probably going to be still uh, a, a bit better, right? Uh, but it, it comes down to a system level cost. And I don't think we know the answer to what those are go really going to be just yet, okay? But uh, I want to make uh, actually another analogy though. The, when we look at very low cost electrochemistry, we're doing something very similar to pumped hydro, compressed air, and even uh, uh, thermal storage. Uh, low cost electrochemistry is providing us with the equivalent of a very low cost working fluid in the same way that water, air, heat are both very low cost working fluids. And so uh, when we have those very low cost chemistries, uh, the cost starts to shift much more to the rest of the plant, you know, how you generate the power, uh, all of the balance of plant that you need, uh, how you manage the fluids. Right? So in that sense, we are, you know, it, it, we're in a similar um, technological realm, I would say. Thank you, Yet. Maybe just a quick follow-up on that for me. So I think one of the major theme of your talk today um, in, in, the, in the systems analysis is that for a long duration storage battery, the power requirement is very low. You're charging and discharging, um, you're, especially you're discharging uh, at fairly low rates. Do you think that could become an advantage for thermal storage if people start looking at not short but long storage? Um, I, and I understand one of the key challenges for thermal today is that charge and discharge power is a problem, uh, especially if you want to convert it back to electricity. Um, yeah. 
uh, in the sense of power, it's a, it's a potential advantage that helps thermal storage. In terms of self-discharge, it's not. Uh, and so, you know, uh, one of the uh, issues with, it depends on the scale, of course, uh, but in thermal storage, you have, you know, you, heat leaks out, right? Uh, and that's self-discharge. Uh, and so the, the larger the system, the better off you are, right? And so it's very system, it's going to be somewhat system size specific. And so that trade-off, the, the, the thermal storage, the uh, technology development efforts that I know of today are still mostly focused around uh, uh, less than a day uh, of storage, maybe a little bit, maybe longer than four hours, uh, but not yet multi-day storage. Thank you. Yeah. So it sounds like um, it may be better in terms of power, relaxing power requirement, but the self-discharging issue will become more significant. Um, yes, uh, but, but maybe you just have to make it really big. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so the second question uh, on the systems level has to do with your perspective on transportation batteries. So you discuss a lot of the challenges and opportunity with grid level storage, but certainly um, we are nowhere near the desired cost level for transportation battery technologies. And you know, in, in recent um, years, we have really sort of seen a renewed interest in less expensive but lower energy density options for transportation batteries, for example, uh, in the iron-based chemistry like lithium iron phosphate with, you know, several major announcements of um, the return of LFP to transportation. I was wondering if you can um, talk a little bit about sort of your perspective and potential pathways to seeing, say, something of an iron or manganese-based chemistry that is potentially much lower in cost and, and chemical costs but then could have the possibility to compete or, or, or approaching to compete on other performance metrics. What does the pathway look like there? Yeah, uh, as, you know, as you know, um, uh, lithium ion phosphate is very near and dear to me. Uh, and I think also not only for transportation, but uh, lithium ion for the grid. Uh, you know, if you look at the low, what are the lowest cost lithium ion options for the grid? I think it's going to, you know, evolve uh, uh, more and more towards uh, LFP. Um, a number of things are happening with LFP. So first of all, you know, one big, of course, uh, being iron-based, it doesn't rely on the uh, cobalt or nickel, but uh, it does on the lithium. Uh, and uh, so uh, the uh, one straightforward option uh, I think is uh, attractive uh, would be LFP coupled with lithium metal, for example. Right? If we're going to solve the lithium metal problem. Uh, then, you know, whether it's with a solid electrolyte or with a liquid electrolyte, uh, we can, you know, take advantage of that energy density boost and still, you know, get to the, uh, get and still be competitive, uh, not for the highest performance cars, perhaps, but for many of them, if we use LFP as the cathode. So that's one that's uh, certainly on my mind. Um, thank you, Yet. Can you comment in particular if there could be a pathway to increasing the energy density of iron or manganese-based chemistries on the cathode side of lithium-ion batteries? Um, well, you know, uh, certainly we, we know the voltage increase from uh, iron to, uh, ma uh, to uh, manganese phosphate. So those, uh, those mixtures uh, are known and uh, have been uh, uh, fairly well developed. So I think that those uh, those are possibilities. Uh, other compounds, I think, is really what you're uh, uh, alluding to. Are there other compounds? And so um, uh, I don't have a a favorite or a particularly uh, high potential prospect there, uh, but uh, maybe others do. Right? Thank you. Yet, um, so maybe we can. Um... Also, get another question on more of the technical detail side. Um, so, on the second part of your oh, on the um, the sulfur-based chemistry, one side of the electrode is a um, four-electron transfer process, and others have also proposed two-electron transfer process involving um, other gases. So this is a bit counterintuitive to use multi-electron transfer uh, because they're inherently more sluggish. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the trade-offs um, by going to multi-electron transfer, um, both in terms of power and energy, 
that you're playing with here uh, in the technology or a commercializing at form? Uh, yes, let's see. Um, so I will, I can tell you what some of the challenges are. You know, we publish these, uh, we publish papers uh, that are, uh, that are uh, uh, not, you know, not, uh, of course, uh, talk, uh, that describe directions in, uh, uh, in uh, battery uh, technology. Uh, and the problems are not fully solved uh, when we uh, publish these papers. And so I would say that, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge is, uh, I, I already pointed out the round trip efficiency challenge, right? Uh, but the, a big part of that is actually the membrane. Right. It's, it's not so much the kinetics in, on either side. So the kinetics on the air breathing side, uh, maybe I should just back up one second and say that in general, if we look at uh, the, the really the bottom of the scale in uh, battery chemistries from a cost perspective, it, what I believe is that uh, the lowest cost ones are going to be some very low cost inorganic with an air electrode. Yeah. And so if you accept that, then the challenge is the air electrode in terms of kinetics, right? But really, I think much more so than the, the, than the other side, than the anode side. And so one of the reasons that in that uh, air breathing aqueous sulfur case, our efficiencies, the maximum we ever measured was around 70%. That was limited by the air cathode, right? And so at the lowest possible current densities, you top out uh, for, uh, uh, for the reasons that uh, many of you are aware of, uh, you, you know, you, we can't really get much higher than about 70%, but I also pointed out why that shouldn't really be a factor. Uh, the the uh, reaction kinetics in the polysulfide are not limiting, right? but the membrane is. And so the membrane in uh, this case, uh, is the, the biggest challenge is that it has to be both high conductivity uh, and blocking but blocking to both acid and base, okay? And that's a particular technical challenge. I think that uh, membranes that can separate strong acids and strong bases is an area of, uh, of uh, research that could be very, very enabling of a lot of new chemistries uh, if we can come up with uh, membranes of that kind. So I hope that helps. So the kinetics, really the, the, the limitations on the air cathode, which is I think what you were alluding to, but not so much the polysulfide, but uh, the membrane is where we really have to spend a lot of time worrying about. Thank you, Yad. It's good to have another challenge for us material scientists. So I think now is a good time uh, to finish up uh, with Yet. Thank you very much. And Yet, stay with us. Uh, we still have a panel discussion afterward. And now we'll switch over uh, to my colleague, Itwe. OK, thank you, Will. Well, Yet, very, very nice talk. Um, and uh, when Will was uh, giving the introduction, I, uh, I look at what I have been doing and say, wow, you know, uh, I think what you, your entrepreneurship has been uh, inspirational to me. Uh, <clears throat> turned out to be, you know, I'm trying to follow your footsteps. Uh, <clears throat> so let me now switch topic uh, quite a bit, you know, yet is giving you the macro to micro uh, perspective, you know, the uh, particularly for grid scale, for, you know, um, also for the larger scale using electrochemistry, the CO2 capture and so on. Um, I want to go down to the nano scale for the materials and the interface, uh, the understanding and design. Well, I want to now um, come back to this and uh, after lithium ion batteries, right, the Nobel was giving very uh, <clears throat> successful commercial uh, activity right there. So we asked these questions. Uh, a wheelchair and I, you know, are leading a Storage X uh, initiative at Stanford. So we asked these questions. Let me uh, give you some of those grand challenges uh, we, are, we are talking about right here. So, and what are the big problems we want to work on for storage? First, jumping out right away is can we keep increasing the energy density? Watt per kilo or watt per liter, right? It's going from 250 watt per kilo to 500. Uh, for the audience, you all know about battery 500 consortium. That is really trying to solve this challenge right there. I mean, for the transportation, 
uh, if we go to 500 watt per kilo with a reasonable size battery pack, we can go to 500 miles driving range. Um, the next is, uh, well, can we extend the battery cycle life even longer, right? 10,000 cycles, 30 years together. You know, certainly you, you could see some of the battery probably reaching 5,000, might even 10,000, but you need to think about the constraint as well. Can I keep the same energy density? Certainly now LFP, L LTO combination can give you very long cycle life, but you cut the energy density by half. Also remember that. Uh, can we you know, maintain the energy density having very long cycle life, right? Then there's many materials, the chemistry issues start to, to, to jump out. Uh, what about fast charging? Can we do it fast enough, you know, 10 minutes or less? I mean, this can change the whole equation, even for the grid scale storage, right? So uh, when you have, um, you know, certain dollars per kilowatt hour of, of electricity, if you could boost up the power, and the power cost uh, is reduced as well. Uh, also, also the safety, we need to talk about safety somehow, uh, the safety is not emphasized enough. You know, we keep seeing the accidents coming out in the grid scale storage. You see the burning in Arizona, you see the burning in, uh, in South Korea, many of those uh, large scale energy storage, for, certainly for cars, you know, every day this, this happened. And the cost down below $50 a kilowatt hour. I mean, from the long duration one, it needs even more. Uh, and yes, presentation, you have seen it. And how do we sense and know the health condition of the batteries? I, I, I would say we, this is the part we probably have, we, we, we have done it poorly as, as the whole community. And battery so far is only two terminal device right there. We rely on the voltage, the current, the impedance, and, and so on to tell us some information. What well, the low cost strategies for battery reuse and recycle, and the grid scale and seasonal, even seasonal storage right there. I think any progress we made in any of these bullet points uh, will be super exciting. So now let me, um, give you a you know, summary of over the last 15 years my group have been doing, try to address some of those ch challenges. In the next uh, about 25, 30 minutes also, of course, no, no, no way to uh, go through all of this, but this is, uh, all these challenges higher on my uh, to-do list. Uh, let me come down to the nanoscale perspective, uh, understanding uh, and, and design of materials and interface. So I'm showing you right here is a micron particle, right? When I use the nanoscale, I mean, to audience, think about this. What does this mean to you, nanoscale? Does it mean to you just simply go down to the particle size, going to the nanoparticle, some sort of nanoscale? If that's the case in your mind, I, I want to open up your mind a lot more. This is only part of it. If you only see going down to smaller size, I think that's quite narrow. And then you are going to see many problems. High surface area, too high surface area, too much chemical reactivity, you say, no, nano would not work, right? So that's, that's not, that's very narrow definition right here. I want you to open your mind a lot more. What we are talking about in nano can include as well as nanoscale coating. How do you do the best coating to stabilize the interface, for example? It could also mean how do you build those particles together forming secondary particle with nanoscale control, nanoscale porosity, and think about a mass and electron transport. And the phenomenon wise, electron and, and, and ion transport needs to be considered and down to nanoscale. You know, some of the materials, electron cannot move so fast, they're too insulating. Ion cannot move so fast. Some phase transformation is deep in the nanoscale we need to consider. Nanomorphology and the wires, tubes, and the you know, different type of shapes allow you to, you know, maximize the electron transport. You should also consider in, in the electro scale, you know, touch austere design, all those thinking, you know, need to come down to the nano scale. So it's very, very rich phenomenon. It's, it's not just nanoparticles. Um, this, why this is so important? <clears throat> Let me show you this plot first. We want to increase energy density, for example. This is the plot I'm making. Uh, my postdoc, a uh, student, uh, pr uh, previous student, yeah, you are now a postdoc in MIT. Vertical acids is relative volume change. Horizontal acids is the amount of lithium you store versus the host atom number, right? We are really sitting on the left-hand side right here in the commercial space. This is the number we are using is roughly one to six. Once you increase the amount of lithium you store, 
it's going to go up more and more and more, right? This ratio just go higher. You know, all this new material starts to show up. The volume expansion is going to change a lot more. So this is the type of material we need to deal with to increase the amount of energy storage we, we have. So the, the uh, material design thinking needs to change because of this dramatic change. So I only want to focus on lithium metal on, in this talk um, and uh, due to limited time. Uh, lithium metal, of course, is well known its problem. Right? It's a plating and stripping problem. You know, you need three million hour per centimeter square of, of uh, capacity or, or higher. So you are talking about 15 micron of lithium deposition and strip away 15 micron. I mean, this is a challenge we have never been able to deal with successfully, you know, for, for the batteries. During this plating process, and uh, because of lithium react with electrolyte forming this SEI and this plating cause the volume change is going to break your SEI somewhere because the plating will not be layer by layer uniformly. You can uh, nuclear the hot spot and grow out this uh, dendritic structure, this filamental structure. During stripping, it's not uniformly stripped, right? You cause the dead lithium formation and uh, before long, and, and your, your battery will lose its efficiency and die fast. And, and plus the safety problem, we all understand this. So I want you to keep in mind is this uh, three million hour per centimeter square is 15 micron you have to deal with. How, how do we handle that? I mean, this is in the single electro scale. If you have multi electro stacking up, your battery, the whole battery cell is going to go crazy, swelling, you know, shrinkage, swelling, and the react, reaction with the SEI, uh, the electrolyte forming SEI. So in this perspective uh, and review papers, we highlight the central part of that. Lithium metal has this problem, high chemical reactivity as well as relative infinite volume change, right? This volume change going from empty state during stripping and to a field state during a, a, a deposition. The relative change is infinite. You need to overcome the rest of surrounding other problem you, you, you observe. So we really need to overcome the, this fundamental, I will say the root causes in the center right there. So that has been guiding my whole research group. I, I believe in uh, many uh, uh, scientists and the research field will agree with me. This is a, a very important root cause that we need to overcome. So we have a build a team right here, particularly with a, a collaboration, uh, uh, the collaboration with Steve Chu and Jinan Bao. You know, one area we are building is, you know, learning from how graphite hosting lithium iron. And we need a host to host lithium metal as well. Otherwise this volume fluctuation will be too big. You cannot handle. Imagine that 50 micron up and down, that change. I don't know how we are going to handle that without a stable host. And the next will be how do we build a stable interface? Understand and building this interface is very important. So speaking of that, if we think about lithium plating and stripping, do we really understand? I mean, the first thing you need to face is the nucleation, particularly if you start with something like copper foil as a current collector and you deposit lithium. And what's the behavior of that? Uh, Alan Payne, my graduate student back in 2017, together we published this paper, right? This is a very classical heterogeneous nucleation problem. And you deposit lithium onto copper. They have different crystal structure, different lattice spacing, and they don't necessarily like each other. And lithium will require a nucleation barrier right there. If you increase the overall potential as drawing right here of this uh, for nucleation, you know, classical nucleation theory Will, will, will tell you increase the overall potential, you drive it harder, you have a smaller nuclei, but the number density is increased a lot. The scaling loop is showing on the top left, you know, critical uh, radius, uh, nuclei radius, right, will go down with overall potential. The relationship is one over over potential. And the number density will go up as a cubic function of overall potential. So we actually measure that top right is the nuclear size uh, versus the uh, current density. The higher the current density, the higher the overall potential. When you plot that, and it fits into the classical heterogeneous nucleation very nicely. A direct picture right here is showing you this different current density from left to right, top to bottom. You, you, you clearly see the, you know, the radius of the lithium nuclei 
becomes a lot smaller with the current density. The number density is increased tremendously with current density fitting nicely into the classical heterogeneous nucleation. So with this observation, let's go one uh, step further. Let's look at this uh, voltage curve, lithium deposition onto copper, showing on, on the lab right here. This, this nucleation barrier highlighted by this voltage D, right, 40 milliwatt and a very low current density, 10 microamp per centimeter square also. But you can find other substrates such as gold. Here is a lithium plating highlighted right here. There's no voltage D. So this clear difference between different materials right there. Uh, Kai Yin was my postdoc now working in Apple and, uh, uh, and discovered this and said, well, let's try to understand this. This is very important for us to control lithium metal deposition down the road. So, so we come to explanation. Look at the phase diagram between copper and lithium on the top, gold and lithium at the bottom right here. And you look at the most right-hand side, Lithium and copper, the copper has no solubility and negligible, right? Solubility in lithium. But gold would have some solubility. You look at this uh, domain. Um, this, what does this mean? It means when lithium coming in during deposition, before lithium metal deposition happened, lithium coming in, you know, alloy with gold, and it has the ability to dissolve gold away because gold has solubility in lithium. So lithium has this uh, ability to make gold more and more look like lithium. After that, lithium deposition happen, happening, this gradual change really remove the uh, nucleation barrier. But lithium on copper is a different story. So uh, they are very different and lattice constant and, and crystal structure. So lithium deposition has nucleation barriers. With this exciting uh, initial discovery, actually we screen a number of different of substrate from gold, silver, zinc, magnesium, right? You see this, this uh, we shift the voltage curve. You look at this, you say, well, for all this substrate, they don't have nucleation barriers right there. You go look at the phase diagram between these materials, this metal and lithium, it fits, the, our explanation really fits. And then you look at copper, nickel and carbon, it always has some nucleation barriers in this voltage deep right there. So having this now allow us for the first time, I mean, design this experiment to have spatial control where lithium deposition will take place. This is an example of a gold pattern onto copper. And you deposit lithium, you see lithium go onto gold, but not copper because of lithium has a nucleation barrier on copper. They don't really like copper. You can, you know, do this, do this, do this experiment going up to reasonable, current density. Of course, if you drive it too hard with high current, then the over potential is too much, you're going to have deposition everywhere. So with that, uh, we designed our first host concept of hollow carbon with gold seed in there. Hollow carbon has nucleation barriers. This is a kind of amorphous, slightly graphitic carbon having some conductivity. Lithium can still penetrate through these uh, carbon. And we suspect when you do deposition within certain current density, lithium only like to nucleate inside this hollow carbon. Then this hollow carbon will be protecting lithium from the outside electrolyte. Certainly the assumption will be this hollow carbon cannot have too big of a pores, otherwise electrolyte will wet, will go in, and then that destroy the purpose. So we made this structure, and uh, with these gold nanoparticles inside this hollow carbon sphere. Um, and I want to show you an in-situ video to indicate, right, when you do lithium deposition inside this hollow carbon, this gold as seed, once lithium coming in, you see this gold is dissolved away. So very powerful. And lithium sit inside, once you strip lithium out, you are going to uh, see the gold nanoparticles coming back. So really proving our idea of the gold seed is uh, having ability to absorb lithium and lithium can dissolve it away. That's the, that's the way to promote uh, nucleation. 
So with lithium, uh, uh, with gold seed and this carbon, the uh, bottom, uh, this hollow carbon, right? we see after deposition certain capacity, you don't see the sort of lithium filament growing out, but the top hollow carbon case, Without gold seeds, you see the lithium metal deposition outside. Very clear difference. If you, you, you look at the battery columbic efficiency, the top is very low. The bottom is a lot better. This is back in uh, 2016. Uh, then we asked the question, you know, what type of carbon would be the best? We have this amorphous carbon with slightly uh, graphitic domain right there. We found out those mechanically is not strong enough. That's why understanding the materials properly need is uh, super important. And, and indeed, if we could grow this highly graphitic carbon, right, using uh, you know, uh, the, some of these uh, catalysts, for example, having a nickel uh, coating right there, you could uh, you know, grow uh, this uh, graphitic carbon and later dissolve away the, the inside, this nickel and you can um, uh, 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 you know, produce this graphene cage. A uh, gold seed in there is the nucleation uh, uh, lo uh, location. This indeed uh, improves the performance quite a bit and the electro becomes a lot more resilient mechanically if you put mechanical force on it. So we, we saw the improvement like that. But what we eventually really want to do is to embed lithium into you know, a host materials, not by electrochemical deposition, right? We want to do it by certain way. You can pre may already pre-store lithium in there. So this lithium metal host composite can be used to pair with other type of electro. They don't have lithium to start with. So Ding Chang and Yao Yuan, you know, really pioneered this area in, in my group. And uh, I have shown this before. You know, if you melt lithium, right, we want to develop a molten lithium process and onto different materials, lithium metal does not really like to wet on many materials until one day, uh, and Ding Chang Yao Yuan try to uh, reduce the graphene oxide, it melts, it goes in. We discover, you know, lithium has this wetting property I mean, similar to water, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, now we call it lithophilic or lithophobic. And, and this, this reduced graphene oxide, right? It's, the weight is very small amount, it's 8% only. You can embed lithium now between the graphene oxide layer. This function as the host to stabilize lithium and then you strip lithium away, its whole volume will not, will not collapse to completely empty. Indeed, if you don't strip all the lithium completely away, you can hold the volume all these uh, holes right there, fix is a thickness. This helps you to increase the stability of uh, lithium metal. Um, so I will jump through this. And, and over the years, you know, not only my group, but certainly the whole research field already developed a number of holes that look very promising uh, to the, uh, you know, promote the sta stable cycling of uh, lithium metal. Now we ask one more question. With all this host right there, you know, uh, fundamentally thinking about lithium transport and what else we need to take care of. Let me use graphene oxide as an example about the toxicity of lithium metal foil, lithium metal host. We know toxicity has been used, right, for your cathode, transition metal oxide cathode or graphite anode. Toxicity, is, it, it is important. So to, to lithium metal, maybe it's even more important. The reason is, you know, lithium metal is through deposition stripping mechanism. Imagine the top row is a graphene oxide horizontally aligned. And uh, if you deposit lithium metal in there, right, this touch, uh, you know, horizontal aligned graphene will have really high touch osity. And, and this will only promote lithium metal deposition on top part of the uh, graphene oxide, not to the bottom. The bottom row is if you have vertically aligned graphene, you know, this ionic path is more uniform compared to the high torches path or horizontally aligned. You can deposit a lot more uniform lithium metal to the vertically aligned. That will promote stability. So we have this hypothesis and uh, how I started to work on this and develop a method using the uh, uh, cooling, the ice crystal formation, right? This is graphene oxide. 
uh, disperse in water. And then you cool down from the bottom, pre produce the ice, it crystallizes, and then it, it's going to propagate from bottom to the top. Turn out to be you can align graphene oxide vertically this way. So this produces a low toxicity. You can also cool it down from the side and align graphene horizontally. Now you have a high toxicity. We could also do the cooling, you know, surrounding cooling. Now you have a random distribution. So this is a three different uh, toxicity comparison. And it's very clear. And the vertical aligned one has low toxicity, give you much stable cycling. I look at the figure A right here, it's vertical aligned graphene that's the most stable in columbic efficiency. The deposition is more uniform, followed by the random graphene, and then followed by horizontally aligned graphene. Uh, uh, it's very clear effect right here. And this toxicity difference, uh, it's, uh, you know, horizontal aligned, Horizontally aligned is about 4.5, randomly is about 1.8, and vertically aligned is about 1.2, 1.3 also. I want you to focus on the bottom uh, SEM. This is cross section view. It's after you know 40 cycle, 40 cycle for the horizontal and uh, randomly aligned. You see this is highly uh, those uh, cut look like more silicium formation. But vertically aligned one giving you, even after 100 cycle, this is a very solid, very dense film. Lithium metal deposition go inside very nicely. So a very clear difference um, in, the, uh, in the behavior. So this is on the material design. We know interface is very important, right? To understand the interface, we, we really need a new tool to, to know that and help us to guide us uh, the design of the interface. I want to share with you, if you look at a uh, fragile bare material such as lithium metal uh, under TEM, I mean, this is room temperature and, and this lithium metal is going crazy. You know, you just start to zoom in and you're going to destroy this lithium metal dendrite right away. Uh, there's no way you can do, you know, imaging and understand, you know, these materials, understand this interface. Um, so a few years ago, three, uh, roughly three years ago, um, my two of my students, you know, we discussed about this problem and, and say cryogenic electron microscopy microscopy might be able to solve this problem. Cryo-EM has been developed by bi biology community, structural biologists, right, in uh, 2017, winning the Nobel Prize. And um, we actually is uh, one, one of the earliest group to adopt this technique, uh, develop the uh, lithium metal deposition and doing the pound free without exposed to the air and the liquid nitrogen environment and transfer into the TEM, stabilize this lithium metal. We know lithium metal reacts with nitrogen. However, lithium metal does not react with liquid nitrogen. We can stabilize this uh, lithium metal, start to do imaging on these materials. We were able to see atomic scale resolution of metallic lithium. I think this is for the first time. In the past, even though some people show some uh, a TM image, I, I highly doubt it that's real lithium metal. Uh, because uh, lithium metal get destroyed so fast by the E-beam. Now in the liquid nitrogen environment, uh, we were able to resolve this. What's really important is this offer very powerful tool. Let's come to the interface. We know the SCI and the, on the end of in the past, and, and there's a proposal by uh, Doron Arba and uh, by uh, Palay about you know, what could be the SCI structure. So uh, taking this question, we could now imaging this lithium metal and resolve this SEI layer. You know, this white line right here is the interface between lithium metal on the top. The bottom layer is really the SEI, about 20 nanometer thick. And this is using uh, uh, ECDEC electrolyte. We could observe the inorganic particles such as lithium oxide and lithium carbonate dispersed into this amorphous matrix. Sounds like a mosaic model. Uh, that's what the uh, Palais proposed uh, you know, a few decades ago. 
And at the same time, when we change the SEI, sorry, the electrolyte, you know, components slightly by adding in fluorinated carbonate, FEC, into the electrolyte, we see the whole SEI structure change completely. Now what you are seeing is this amorphous layer in the bottom and the top layer, this beautiful inorganic coating, right? FEC is oftentimes no, you add an FEC, columbic efficiency is improved. So, and uh, this SEI change, the structure change completely explain this. And with this inorganic coatings uniformly on the top, these uh, uh, really uh, stabilize the uh, lithium metal a lot more columbic efficiency gets higher. Uh, so this really resonates with uh, Doron's uh, layer by layer model of SEI with some modification is actually not inorganic coating on the top. Indeed, the uh, uh, cryo-EM is so powerful over the past three years also, we have been using the cryo-EM for the battery research for other fragile materials such as the metal organic framework. And, uh, and we work on electrocatalysis, you know, looking at the catalyst, perovskite solar cells. And, and it opened up you know, really uh, exciting opportunity for I think material science community I mean, to uh, renew the inches of using uh, cryo-EM. Uh, cryo-EM was invented in the material science community. Uh, you know, the impact wasn't big enough, but structural biologists uh, took this tool, developed it further for uh, solving protein crystal structure. Now, uh, with all this development, it, it can have great impact now com coming back to the material science community. Uh, uh, you know, in the last uh, uh, three years, these 10 papers we published, just many things are the first time we can resolve. So uh, I will not have time to discuss this. And, and also please see the work uh, by uh, Shirley Meng and UCSD and Lena's work uh, in, in Cornell. And they, they have been doing also nice work as well in the cryo -EM. Um, now I want to go deeper into the interface issue. We keep talking about the SEI, for, for example, for lithium metal, you know, for silicon, for, for, for graphite. Now, can we really understand how the charge transfer are happening at the interface before you form the SEI? For example, right here, we have a lithium metal, right? It is, you have a lithium that's solvated by this uh, uh, schematic drawing, the you know, solvation shell. And to deposit lithium, lithium ion needs to pick up an electron. Electron needs to transfer to lithium ion and deposit up become atoms. And if without the SEI, how does it look? The reason we are interested in this question without the SEI is this type of study allow us to really understanding the lithium solvation shell, its impact to this uh, charge transfer process free of SEI. And if once SEI come, and another scenario will start to, to, to appear. So in order to understand that, we developed tools a few years back uh, using this uh, micro electro showing on the top left right here. This is about radius about 12 micron uh, also, right? The exposure of very small areas. And then when you are doing the, uh, the CV measurements, scan your voltage, measure your current, you can scan very fast. With this micro electro cross section is so small and the lithium flux going in, and it's towards this kind of point sources, right, point source. And, and it's less limited by the mass diffusion. So through this voltage curve, the uh, uh, CV scan, right, you can see, you know, J, that's current density versus the, uh, the voltage. You can scan very fast, you know, up to 20, 30 watt per second. So we are, you're finishing this measurement one scan, less than a second. So now you look at this zoom in and look at this uh, range of the uh, small voltage window. The, it's independent of scan rate. This is the regime right now. It's electron transfer control regime. You are not controlled by the mass transfer right here, the mass transport. This uh, micro electro really give the advantage to study the charge transfer uh, uh, free of uh, you know, a mass transfer li limit. So this is turned out to be quite exciting for us to go into the detail to analyze this curve within the electron transfer limit. So, and, and David Boy, my graduate student right there, did a great job in here in analyzing. For example, this dotted line is our, a dotted uh, 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 dot is our experimental curve. To fit this curve, turned out to be the classical, uh, a butter warmer model will not be able to fit it. 
Uh, it can only fit within very narrow plus minus 50 milliwatt of voltage range. It's uh, going over that it doesn't fit. And we need to go to Marcus model. And uh, these uh, re uh, reorganization energy lambda equals to about 0.3 watt. It fits very nice, nicely. Marcus model really, uh, you know, take into account this uh, voltage uh, dependence. You know, um, when you have charge transfer, the solvation shell, the solvation structure, you know, solvent needs to reorganize itself to uh, uh, accommodate this change. So consider that this energy cost right there. So Marcus theory allow us to fit this very nicely. Uh, and, um, and with this in mind, this model in mind, we now can look into different electrolyte, you know, for example, and this problem I'm highlighting and the same ECDC solvent with different salt. This anion, arsenic fluoride, phosphorus fluoride, and the perchlorate, they have different binding strength with lithium and its solvation structure is different. And this actually fits very nicely. And this uh, arsenic fluoride one, the current density is very high and your Jano exchange current, current is much higher than uh, a perchlorate and uh, uh, phosphorus hexafluoride. And uh, the reason is uh, this hexane ion is much bigger. It binds weaker with lithium. I mean, your solvation uh, uh, energy right there is uh, smaller. And, and also, a screen different uh, solvent and electrolyte, we also established the correlation. Solvation energy affecting the charge transfer as well as viscosity. So we start to be able to establish very nice correlation of uh, uh, electron transfer across this interface because this uh, scan is so fast, less, less than a second. This is really in a situation free of uh, SEI. SEI doesn't grow that fast. Um, so I want to emphasize the interface. You know, we, we really need to modify eventually this interface, make it stable to prevent further chemical reaction between very reactive anode with the electrolyte. You know, we consider hollow carbon sphere in the past, boron nitrate and graphene, two D layer materials, and uh, electrolyte additives, right, continue to be important. And uh, you know, new type of materials such as nano diamond, they're very strong, chemically very stable to suppress the lithium metal uh, danger formation. And uh, you know, we look into lithium fluoride. How do you form very dense lithium fluoride? And in collaboration with Bluestone and UCLA, we, we look at that, you know, developing a gas a, a species, you know, a full a process to form lithium fluoride and a new type of lithium nitro formation and high temperature, very dense. So we explore further with Jenan Bao, we explore you know, cell healing polymer, dynamic polymer that can self heal. So these are all, all for new type of idea for the interface. Uh, uh, due to limited time, let me only highlight one example. Certainly, you know, electrolyte continue to be important. Uh, Jason Zhang in PNNL, uh, uh, also Kang Shi, and uh, Chen Sun Wang, they have been doing really great job in there. Let me report back to you. And recently we discovered a new molecule function as solvent, highlighted right here called FDMB. This is solvent based on the rational design. We know DME is actually can form good SEI, right? This is an either, but DME is not stable against the high voltage. Below four watt versus lithium, it starts to decompose quite a bit. <clears throat> So we, we want to ex extend this uh, chain further. Now becomes a more hydrocarbon chain. Uh, this increases the stability and still maintain the either the two oxygen, you know, to forming good SEI. However, this is not a uh, uh, you know stable enough. The DMB we need to add in fluorine. Two fluorine right here turn out to be this molecule didn't exist before. This is first time making this molecule. It has amazing effect and as a solvent. You know, with these uh, three different type of molecule as solvent we compare, right? And, and these uh, 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 FDMB with fluorine, it can stabilize, go up to higher voltage during this current versus voltage measurement. And this half cell, the lithium copper half cell, and cycling columbic efficiency, within five cycles go up to quite high. You know, you deposition, you strip right away, more than 99% right away, using our buff method, 
to do the cycling. That is, you deposit certain capacity and you cycle shallow that. And then you strip all the lithium away to judge the uh, columbic efficiency. You actually get up to 99.5%. So in this nature energy, we actually have a lot more data to show you to pair with the real cathode is very you know, stable, all for quite amazing performance. So this is uh, some of the uh, picture, the top view. Uh, this is DME, this is DMB, uh, this C is uh, FDMB. You know, the brain size become a lot bigger. It's actually a lot more stable. We also discovered the SEI using the cryo EM imaging for, for the FDMB. This SEI is all amorphous, but very uniform. It's really thin, only six nanometers. You know, previously, ECD is the electrolyte. You easily is a 20 nanometer SEI. You know, DME is 10 nanometer. It's less uniform. Uh, uh, it has some, you know, other, you know, uh, inhomogeneity right there. Turn out to be FDMB is very uniform. So the further study indicate through the simulation, if you look at FDMB, actually the color is brownish color. You know, other electrolyte will be transparent. Turn out to be is lithium coordination can not only coordinate with oxygen and the F. DMB, but also the fluorine, you know, through this uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation, we try to uh, now figuring out uh, already to some degree of how coordination happen in this electrolyte. So it's actually quite exciting. I encourage you to, to read about this, uh, our new work just coming out a, a couple of weeks ago, and, and this discovery of new type of solvent to form electrolyte. And uh, having, uh, I mean, one of the, I, I would say one of the best performance uh, discovered so far, you know, for lithium metal in, in, in the whole uh, battery community. So I, I think my time is up. I, I won't, you know, uh, go into detail summary of that. So the material design and the nanoscale as well as uh, the interface so important. And, uh, uh, you know, doing research uh, to address the grand challenges we identify continue to be the theme of the research group. Uh, uh, let me end my talk by uh, thanking uh, my, my whole uh, research group and also the uh, funding support, particularly from DOE. Thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions you have and also going to the panel discussion with uh, this yet later. E, thank you very much uh, for the very comprehensive talk. And uh, I've took the liberty to organize the questions since we're a little bit tight on time. Um, so the first group of question has to do with the effect of nucleation on the subsequent morphology. So in many of the experiments that's done in the laboratory, there are complete um, cycling. So every single cycle you have to strip all the way down and nuclear again. But in a real life operation, often, as you mentioned, the cycling is very shallow, so you don't undergo nucleation every time. So you reported um, several ways to con uh, con control the nucleation morphology, which has an effect on the subsequent morphology. So the question has to do with how well does the growth morphology remember the nucleation morphology in these realistic cycling conditions? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's a question we ask ourselves all, all over the time. And um, so after first nucleation, right, I mean, it's very important the first nucleation will determine uh, the second in the third cycle, how it will deposit. I imagine you have a lot of nuclei versus fewer nuclei. You already, you know, uh, grow this lithium, their morphology will be very different. And then with more and more cycle going on, um, you know, this is a question uh, we have not studied carefully yet with more and more cycle right there. And uh, this memory can last for how long? However, I, I bet the damage, if there's any damages to, to start with, you already have it. So you want to do it even if it's the first few cycle memory. It's already very important. You can lose a lot of lithium this way. And uh, uh, that will be the, the answer. But later, I mean, in the future, I think this memory effect, we, we could look into more. Thank you. And related to this point, um, there's been a, a very significant body of work, um, many from you, on the effect of um, deposition of lithium. How about the stripping on the morphology? Uh, what do we know about the effect of stripping? Yes. Well, this is an excellent one. So I rarely talk about stripping, even though we have a few studies. In one of our PNAS paper, 
uh, my uh, previous post of Fei Fei uh, um, did this study on uh, the stripping is actually very important as well because stripping is the case you can form voids. Uh, stripping can cause significant uh, in uniformity right there and your SEI won't be as uh, you know uniform and then the stripping coming in cause the void formation which we, we tend to see the pit formation easily. So stripping I would say equally important as, as deposition so we shouldn't overlook. Thank you, E. Um, the next question has to do with the effect of SCI on the electron transfer kinetics. So you show through the ultra microelectro experiment, it's possible to learn um, the native electron transfer on lithium metal before the SCI forms. The question has to do with after you let the SCI form, how does the exchange current density, how does the reorganization energy have you seen a big dependence and evolution of those quantities upon SCI formation? Yeah, um, the SCI formation certainly number one will change the exchange current density, reduce it uh, uh, by a lot. For example, by about hundred times, we, we could see that uh, change. And uh, if without SCI, you know, easily we see 10 milliamp per centimeter square type of exchange current density. But once SCI formation, it drops a lot. Mm -hmm. And then once it drops a lot, then electron transfer, of course, SCI is also block, blocking the electrons, right? And electron transfer becomes, it's not the limited step anymore. It will be, you know, how the lithium desolvated go through the SCI. I, I, I think that's the limiting step, so. Great, thank you, E. Uh, and then just the final question. Um, so you discussed very briefly the importance of safety. And you have shown a lot of success in controlling the morphology, in controlling SCI on lithium metal. So suppose one day all these problems are fully solved. How about safety? What are some of your directions on managing the safety of a lithium metal battery in the charge state? Yes, even with all those problems, well, we, are, we will be very nice because of all those problems you mentioned, even with those problems solved, we have not solved the safety problem yet. So safety right here, uh, not only means the shorting of due to lithium dendrite, but also in the charged state. Uh, and this carries so much energy. If you go into the nail penetration test, right, you heat up the batteries, it carries so much energy, lithium metal has high surface area, and this safety issue still exists. And, and some of the strategy will be, we, we absolutely need a very good fire retardants put it into the, uh, the batteries. But fire retardant going in, change the viscosity, make it viscous. So very hard to put a whole lot in. How do you kind of encapsulate the uh, fire retardants and put it into the batteries? I mean, as one example, I would say to help the safety. And then there's a, in the chemistry materials level all the way up to I, I was a system level of design. I, I think can be in place to, to, to address the safety. Thank you. There are many more questions that we could not get to today. So I encourage uh, the audience to reach out directly to Professor Tui um, or Professor Chang uh, for further discussion. So now we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes left. I'd like to invite Yet uh, to come back. There you are Yet, welcome back. I'm back. And now I have had the, have the pleasure of having a conversation with the both of you, um, which is a uh, daunting task, I would say. So I thought I would go back to how I introduced the both of you, um, being innovators both in the academic setting, but also in the tech transfer setting. And one thing I have noticed and, and this is well recognized in the startup world, is that there's always a competition between the degree of disruption one hopes to achieve and the time and the resources that it takes. And often we see folks trying to make incremental disruption, but you can do it very quickly. Or there are people trying to make the huge disruptions that takes um, 10 or 20 years. Uh, lithium on battery being one of those that required uh, extensive investments of resources. So I was wondering if we can have a discussion around this. 
to think about how this is being done today, maybe also ideas on how this could be changed in the future or how to affect the investment and the tech transfer um, environment so that uh, we can make the necessary uh, big breakthrough that's needed. So yeah, maybe we can start with you and share some thoughts on this topic. I was thinking that uh, as you were speaking there that uh, you know, uh, sometimes the investors take care of that for you. <laughs> if it's incremental, they won't invest. Right? Uh, but if it's incremental but uh, impactful, incremental is not necessarily a, a bad word. If it's impactful, you know, industry is, is uh, often, uh, if it's a drop in, right? If it's a drop in, there are many avenues to have impact, right? And you can have big impact even if it's uh, incremental. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, for startups, if it's incremental, it's not interesting. If it's a 20 year project, it's not interesting. I think that, uh, but you know, what's a really great sign is that there are so many, uh, you know, climate and, and clean tech mission oriented uh, investors out there now who, uh, number one, their mission is in the area of this kind of hard technology that we're all interested in. And the second is that they have a you know kind of a ten year view on things, and uh, you know uh, if you, of course you always want to do it faster, but if you think in terms of ten years and not three, uh, you can do a lot. Okay. Thank you, Yad. E, I, could we also have your thoughts on this as well? Uh, absolutely. Um, so um, I, I agree with what Yad is uh, saying. Um, I also have the observation and say, well, sometimes, you know, you, you have a great idea. You think this can change the world, can be big impact. And, uh, and your judgment, my judgment oftentimes in the early days uh, is not completely right. How long can, can it take? Because I know less about the industry. That's why talking to industry, uh, super important, you calibrate yourself. I think Yet has a lot of experience already and know how, how long it will take. Um, and um, so then you say, well, where, when is the right time? Right? At Stanford, MIT, we have a lot of students go from the startup. And that's wonderful. You know, it's really brave and, and going in. And, and certainly investors will come in and say, I agree with yet, yeah, maybe seven years, maybe 10 years, maybe a little bit shorter. Right? I need to see something. Um, then you ask the question, when are we going to take out this technology to, to the real world, to, to you know, doing commercialization? I, I always have something, uh, one, one thought in my mind, I said, if I can raise funding in university, continue, I see so many problems I need to work on, I just continue doing that for a little bit longer. But it's not always entirely possible to raise funding to do so. Then you can consider saying, well, I want to transfer that into industry uh, a little bit earlier. I, this this a, this a zone right there. It's not a you know hard deadline, but it's a zone you can do a little bit early, a little bit later. It highly depend on the real situation. If you can raise funding in university, why not? You know, university has a lot of resources to further understand this. If not, I mean, going into the industry, you can see a pathway within seven years. You you could hit somewhere, then uh, go for it. Maybe uh, Will, if I could come back in with just a couple of more comments on that. You know, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, a big, uh, it's a big surprise when you see a, a really top notch industry lab and realize that it can do a hundred times the experiments that you can do in your university lab. Right? And so uh, if uh, the way I think about it, if there are problems where scaling the rate at which you can do the, uh, the work uh, really is the key to success, then it's really time to get it out there and just uh, let that happen. Mm -hmm. okay. But uh, if you're at a stage where it's an idea and uh, you know, more money doesn't help solve the problem, right? and it's really, you need a better idea uh, for part of what you're trying to develop. Uh, that's when, you know, that's when it should still, you know, that's something you should focus on in your university lab. And more money isn't necessarily going to solve the problem. It may give you more shots on goal in some sense, right? But uh, when it comes down to, you know, you, if it's uh, being, if doing uh, experiments at 10 times the pace will just get you to the answer that much faster, then it's probably time to, to sorry, let that happen. Thank you, Ed. I think that's uh, extremely um, uh, great and simple. 
uh, description of the delineation between academic research and, um, and beyond. So both of you, Ian Yet, highlighted that developing technologies take a lot of time. And if we do a sort of a simple estimation, so many reports really argue that we need to have solutions starting to roll out on a massive scale. Um, I think yet you mentioned 2050 as one number. So that's exactly 30 years from today. And if we look at the technology development history of today's lithium ion battery, um, you know, one can argue exactly how long it took, but it probably took uh, somewhere from 20 to 30 years to get it to a point where um, it is near to what it is today. So do you both have an indication how much time do we have to innovate um, at the very early stage by considering how much time is needed to transfer it, to have it come to market or some massive adoption by 2050? Uh, how much time do we have and how hard do we need to work? Yeah, do you want to take that first? Sure, I'm happy to take it first. You know, if you look at the history of lithium ion, it required a designer material for every single part of the battery. Right? It required a designer cathode, designer electrolyte, designer anode, designer membranes, <laughs> and all of these additives. Uh, so, you know, I'm, yeah, uh, so designer materials, I, I think, you know, I'm as big a fan of them uh, as anyone, but I think to scale quickly, uh, we have to start looking at uh, creative ways. Uh, the idea is you're often not the bottleneck, right? It's the process of coming, uh, of making that design and material work. The creative ways of using these ultra low cost materials. Now, the way I, the one way I sometimes describe it is that if you're, if you're a chef, it's actually, it takes much more creativity to make a great dish with really low cost ingredients than with expensive ingredients, right? And so you have to, I think we have to apply that kind of, you know, creativity to looking at you know, th these ultra abundant materials and find new ways to, to make them work. Yeah. So, oh, okay, I didn't answer how long, right? <laughs> but <laughs> that's, that's clearly the approach we're taking a form, you know, trying to get some, you know, low cost, very abundant materials, uh, you know, uh, in to market, in scale, in a, a very, in much shorter than the, the usual time. So, so real. If you look at you know about twenty thirty years, right? You, you mentioned twenty fifty. The CO two level we need to go below certain level with two degrees C within control. You know, hit to the scale. I, I I would say any probably any new ideas, new new chemistry, we better implement this within the uh uh within ten years to to make a impact. You know, uh, right there, and then there's a another 20, 30 years, 10, 20 years, you need to scale up to the level. So probably about 10 years also, we need to get, get this all, all in. Um, yeah, we, we really don't have much time. And then how do we speed up that? Uh, working harder is one solution. <laughs> and, uh, but also I, I see, I mean, I, I watch the solar industry and the, the growing people think solar was mature when you back to 10 years ago. No, not, not yet. And there's a lot of collective innovation together and the whole supply chain all need to come together. Somehow this communication speed needs to go faster to all do it. I mean, all the way from mining, you know, to, to the top. I, I think the whole supply chain just need to communicate uh, so frequently to, to push forward. Thank you, E. Um, so, before we finish here, I just want to make a, a, a quick comment. It's truly a pleasure to have both of you present today um, side by side. Um, between the two of you, you have catalyzed the investments of billions of dollars um, into battery industry, uh, uh, some of your, in, in your own startups. Uh, I think um, I can join the rest of the community by thank you for your many contributions. Now, normally I would close, but I just received a question from uh, from Sting Wintingham, so I think I cannot ignore that question. So I, <laughs> I will read Stan your question verbatim. Uh, so this is question is for yet. So Stan asks, do you see a resurgence of olivine for grid storage and even EVs as demand for nickel and cobalt goes up? 
So Stan gets to have the last question here, and yet you can have the, the last word for today. Thank you. Absolutely. I think so. I think that uh, low cost lithium ion is for the grid uh, and even for you, it's going to be uh, defined by uh, non resource constrained materials. And uh, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, LFP has so many things going for it as a grid storage chemistry. I uh, find it hard to believe that we will not revert to that more, especially as the cobalt nickel. Uh, uh, availability and prices uh, become under pressure. Thank you. So um, we will continue next week at our usual time. Uh, our next two speakers are Professor Martin Winter at the University of Munster, uh, who's leading many of the large efforts in the European Union. Uh, so he will be giving us the European perspective on energy storage. And um, we'll also be joined by Professor Shelley Meng from the University of California, San Diego, uh, who will also discuss many of the materials challenges uh, in next generation battery technologies. And with that, I'd like to thank you uh, on the behalf of Itwe and myself uh, for joining our symposium. I hope to see you all next week.